right, uh, the title of this morning, uh, this morning's sermon is Hope for Hard Cases. Hope for Hard Cases. Now, what do I mean by a hard case? I'm, I'm speaking specifically about somebody who isn't saved. That's a hard case. Now, not every person that isn't saved is a hard case, but there are certain people, and that I'm sure we all have one in our life that we're probably more than likely related to, or somebody that we know that isn't saved, Somebody that we've probably talked to about Jesus Christ. Somebody that we've probably, probably tried to give the gospel to. But they've just resisted it. They, they, they've not gotten saved. And we, they are what we would call a hard case. They're somebody that's hard to come to, to bring around to the knowledge of salvation. They're resisting the preaching. Uh, it might be somebody that we've known and preached to maybe even for years. Somebody that's been very, might, uh, might be clo close to us. And if, you know, the Bible has got many examples of people that are hard cases. And in the book of Acts alone, we see many examples of this. And if you would, keep something in Acts 18 all morning, because we'll be back and forth there. We're going to look at a specific example a little bit later on in Acts 18 of a, of a hard case. But I want us to understand that no matter how hard the case seems to be, there's always hope for that person. And we see that time and time and time again in the Scriptures. And we should never get discouraged and think that somebody that we know or love that has you know, rejected the Gospel... It's beyond hope of salvation. Now, of course, we understand, you know, that there are certain people that are what the Bible calls a reprobate, that have been given over, that cannot cannot be seen. Jesus said to certain of the Jews that they could not believe, yet because God had blinded their minds and their, and their hearts and their eyes, because they had for so long resisted God. And I do believe that a person can resist God for so long and to the point where God actually gives them over to the reprobate mind. But I believe that those keep, those are, you know, that's the minority of people. Some people just seem to resist God just out of pride, a false way that they're involved in. You know, sometimes, often, it's a, it's a child coming to a parent. Those of us that have got saved a little older in life, didn't come from a, a Christian home, you know, we have parents that are unsaved, and we want to see them saved. But it's often hard for a parent to receive instruction from a child. You know, if they were to come to tell you, hey, especially when it comes to matters of, you know, spirituality, of going to heaven when you die. Probably the greatest question that you could ever ask anybody. That might be hard for a parent to receive from a child. Hey, let me answer life's most compelling question. What happens when you die? I figured it out, Mom and Dad. Let me tell you about it. Right? But we should never give up hope on these people. We should always understand that it's not necessarily that they hate God. It's just that they're a hard case. Now, if you would, turn over to Acts chapter 12. And I want us to remind us of some hard cases that are in the Scriptures. Some people that are that are, were hard to see, to come to Christ. They weren't quick. That they were ones that resisted God often. They were ones that resisted the Spirit often. You're going to Acts chapter 12, but the Bible says in John 11 that uh, the Jews that they are ones that often resisted the, the Spirit of God. They were ones that often resisted God. We see that throughout the New Testament. For example, Jesus said to them, uh, "Master, the Jews of late." This is actually his disciples said unto Jesus, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone thee. And goest thou thither again? This is, of course, when Jesus is going into Jerusalem for that last time. And they, and they say to him, you know, the, the Jews, they want to stone you. I mean, I mean, how much more resistant of Jesus Christ can you be to the point where you're willing to kill him? You know, if we were to go through the New Testament, specifically in the Gospels, and look at all the times that the, God, that the, that the Jews desired to lay hands on Jesus... When he preached in the synagogue, they took him out into a, into a hill. They were going to cast him down a hill and kill him. And how many times they wanted to, to stone him or, or harm him, but they weren't able to. So we see that the Jews are people that consistently resisted God in the New Testament. They resisted him specifically with Jesus. They wanted to kill him. They resisted the apostles. If you're there in Acts chapter 12, look at verse 1. Now about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hand to vex certain of the church, and he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. I mean, that's kind of a tragedy. Right in the beginning of the book of Acts, practically, right when the New Testament church is taking off, one of the main disciples, one of the twelve, James, the brother of John, is killed with the sword. And because he saw it, because Herod the king saw it, that it pleased the Jews. When the Jews heard that James had gotten killed with the sword, it didn't bother him. It pleased them. It made them happy to know that one of Christ's disciples had been killed. It says that he proceeded further to take Peter also. You know, he was willing to do them a pleasure. He said, oh, that pleased the Jews? Well, let me take Peter also. And of course, if you know the story, the angel come and miraculously delivers Peter. Go ahead and turn over to uh, Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7. 
We'll see another example of the Jews being ones that consistently resisted God throughout the New Testament. They were hard cases. We go to Acts 7 by remind us that the Apostle Paul was one that was known for being a hard case. It says in Acts 9, verse 20, and straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues. This is, of course, after Paul gets saved. He's on the road to Damascus. He sees the great light. The Lord speaks to him. He goes blind. And, and then he gets saved. And the Bible says, and straightway after he got saved, that Paul preached Christ in the synagogues, that he is the Son of God. But Saul increased more in strength and confounded the Jews which dwelt at Jerusalem, proving this is very Christ. And after many days were fulfilled, the Jews took counsel to kill him. So one of their own, Paul, who was a Pharisee of the Pharisees, he said, gets saved and then begins to preach Christ to the people that knew him, the Jews, they took counsel to kill him. They're resisting the Spirit. They're hard cases. Look at Acts chapter 7 and verse 51. We'll see it again where the Jews were resisting the Holy Ghost. I mean, Stephen just calls them out for it in Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7, the Bible says in verse 51, Acts 7, 51, Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised and hardened ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost. He said, you always resist. He's preaching the Jews. He says, you know what? You guys always resist the Holy Ghost. And he wasn't pulling any punches. I mean, he calls them some names. He calls them stiff-necked and uncircumcised and hard. They were stiff-necked. What's that mean? They were, they had a, like they were stiff-necked. They weren't, they weren't, uh, they were ignorant. They were proud. They were stubborn. You think of somebody who doesn't have a stiff neck. You know, when they get called on the carpet, when they get told they're wrong, often what does a person do? They drop their head. And, and, and an acknowledgement of the wrong that they've done. But the Jews weren't that way. When they were told, look, Christ is the Savior. Jesus is the Christ. They were stiff necked. They kept it up. They said, no, he isn't. They resisted the Holy Ghost. And then it goes on in verse 52 and, and tells us, we, I mean, we, we're not going to take the time to do it, but we can go back in the Old Testament and just see time after time after time where the Jews are resisting God, resisting His commandments, not desiring to do the things of God. And he says, Stephen says to them in verse 52, which of the prophets have your fathers not persecuted? Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? They have slain them which were showed before the coming of the just one, and whom he have now been the betrayers and murderers. I mean, you think I've ever preached a hard sermon. This guy is up there just ripping face. Calls them the betrayers, calls them murderers, calls their fathers these things. So we see just all these examples with the apostles, with Jesus himself, with the apostle Paul, with, with Stephen here, where they're, the Jews are just stiff-necked, they're hard-hearted, and they're hard cases. They resist the Holy Ghost. And we can talk about the Old Testament, but we won't for the sake of time. Now, I say all that because I want to remind us of the fact that even in the New Testament, we also see many Jews getting saved, don't we? We also see many of these religious Pharisees, these Jews, getting saved. If you would, turn over to Acts chapter 2. Go to Acts 2. While you're going to Acts 2, I'm going to read you from the book of John, verse chapter 11. Where it says, Then many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen the things which Jesus did, believed on Him. So many of these Jews are, are seeing the things which Jesus did, and they believe on Him. It says in uh, John 12, But the chief priests consulted that they might put Lazarus to death, because that by reason of Him, many of the Jews went away. So even though these Jews were very hard-hearted, even though they were very stiff-necked, even there were some that were very... They were what we would call hard cases. The Bible makes it clear that there are also many of them, I'm trying not to sneeze right now, that also got saved. You're there in Acts chapter 2, look at verse 37. <clears throat> now when they heard this, this is of course when Peter stood up and preached that message of the day of Pentecost. And the Jews heard them and it says now in verse 37, Now when they had heard this, they were pricked in their hearts and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and he shall receive the Holy Ghost, the gift of the Holy Ghost. Then look there at verse 41. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day were added unto, this, about, unto them about 3,000 souls. 
So yeah, they were hard cases, but we see a lot of them coming to Christ. Now, they didn't all happen right away. A lot of things had to happen. I mean, Jesus had to have His earthly ministry. He had to die, rise again. They had to see a lot of things happen with the apostles. They had to hear a lot of preaching. I mean, think about the Apostle Paul. I think he was around for most of what... He probably saw... I, it, it wouldn't surprise me one bit if the Apostle Paul heard a lot of Jesus Christ preaching himself. And he had to have known who Jesus was. I'm getting ahead of, my head, ahead of myself a little bit. But we see a lot of these people getting saved. It might not have been overnight. It might not have been immediately. They were hard cases. And you know what? We probably have some hard cases in our lives too. People that we care about that are, that are rejecting Christ, that are being resistant, they're being stiff-necked in their own way. <clears throat> now in our text back there, if you would, it kept something there in Acts chapter 18. I want to look at two Jews specifically in our text that got saved. In Acts 18, we see two Jews who got saved. The first one I want us to notice is Crispus. Okay? Acts 18 and verse 7, the Bible says, And he departed thence and entered into a certain man's house named Justice, one that worshipped God, whose house joined hard to the synagogue. Look at verse 8. And Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue. Okay, so Paul's in Corinth, and this guy Crispus is the chief ruler of the synagogue. I mean, he was, a, he was somebody. He had some clout. He had some weight to throw around in the synagogue. He was the chief ruler. Not a chief ruler. It says the chief ruler. It says that he believed on the Lord with all his house. So here we see a, a guy that was, you know, a Jew, probably maybe a hard case, maybe, I don't know, but we definitely see that he was one that got saved. And it doesn't go into a lot of detail about his salvation, what it took or anything like that. But we see that that's one of the two Jews that got saved. The other one I want to look at a little more closely is the one that we know for a fact is a hard case. And that's this guy named Sosthenes. Look at verse 17. And the, all the, then all the Greeks took Sosthenes the chief ruler of the synagogue, this is still in Corinth, by the way, and beat him before the judgment seat. And Gal Gallio cared for none of those things. Now, if you remember the story here in Acts 18, Paul comes into Corinth, right? He preaches in the synagogue. He shakes his raiment. And he says, you know, you always do blaspheme. Your blood be on your own heads. I am clean. I go into the Gentiles. And he goes in the house of justice. And then the next verse, we see Crispus get saved. And then if you remember the story that Paul was, continued there a year and six months. So in that time that Paul was there, this guy Sosthenes takes the place of Crispus as the chief ruler. Right? And then they commit insurrection. They take Paul before Gallio to, to, to uh, try to get him in trouble with the, with, the, with the Jews. Excuse me, with the Romans. And, uh, and, and, and God just kind of turns it on its head. And Sosthenes is the one that ends up getting beat. Now, I believe that Sosthenes, you say, well, how is it? How do you know Sosthenes got saved? Well, first of all, let me just make the case from this text, because we're going to turn somewhere else here in a minute. But there is nothing in this text that would indicate that he didn't get saved. I mean, we don't see anything in the story that says Sosthenes was a reprobate, anything to make us think that he was one that was, you know, given over to a, a reprobate mind, that he was one that could not get saved. There's nothing in the text here that says that he couldn't have gotten saved. Okay? Now, some people might object to, to me saying that he got saved because of the way he handled Paul. They'd say, well, yeah, but he was the one that, you know, probably, he was the chief ruler of the synagogue. He's the one that committed insurrection and had Paul arrested. He was trying to get Paul, uh, you know, killed or, or at least beaten or something. And they'd say, well, you know, look how he's handling God's man. How can you say this guy got saved? But that objection, I would remind us of Paul's testimony. Of Paul's testimony. If you recall Paul's testimony... It says that he straightway preached Christ in the synagogues. But all that heard him were amazed and said, Is not this he that destroyed them which called on his name in Jerusalem? I mean, when Paul got saved, he had a reputation as one that destroyed the church of God. He was one that went and hailed men and women with, with letters from the Jews to take them bound to Jerusalem and cast them into prison, have them put to death. He was one that destroyed the faith. That was the testimony of Paul before he got saved. So what is it, you know, what is Sosthenes that's doing anything worse than what Paul had done? There's nothing here in the text that shows us that, so that Sosthenes could not have gotten saved. In fact, if you would turn over to 1 Timothy chapter 1. Again, keep something in Acts 18, but turn over to 1 Timothy 1. I want us to understand this, because this is important. That Paul wasn't the, you know, the best guy in the world when he got saved. That he was a hard case. 
And he was a hard case far more than Sosthenes was, in my opinion. From what we see in the Scripture, anyway. From what we know of Sosthenes, and he compared it to what Paul did, it's, it's a far cry. <clears throat> The Bible says, you're going to 1 Timothy 1, I'll remind us what the Bible says in Galatians 1 about Paul. It says, Afterwards I came into the regions of Syria and Cilicia and was unknown by the face of the churches of Judea which were in Christ, but they had heard only that he which persecuted us in times past now preaches the faith which once he destroyed and they glorified God in me. So here we have this hard case in Paul the Apostle. We had that reputation as one who destroyed the faith, now preaching Christ. You're there in 1 Timothy 1. Look at verse 15, 1 Timothy 1, 15. This is a faithful saying worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Paul just said he was the chiefest of sinners. He had no, no uh, misgivings or misunderstandings about who he was and what he had done. He says in verse 16, How be it for this cause I obtain mercy. He's about, he's about to tell us the cause as to why he obtained mercy. Even though he was the chiefest of sinners. Even though he was one that destroyed the faith at one time. He said, I obtain this mercy for this cause, that in me first Christ Jesus might show forth all long suffering for a pattern. Now what's a pattern? It's something that others could take and follow, right? For a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on a life everlasting. You know, Paul serves as an example of a hard case in Scripture. He's somebody that we can look to and say, we, could, we, could, we have some hard case in our life, we have somebody that we don't think can get saved, that they're just so hard-hearted, they've just resisted the Gospel for so long. We need to take them and hold them up to the pattern of Paul and see how it matches up. Amen. And, what, and ask ourselves, is there still any hope for this person? <clears throat> well, I don't know, have they destroyed the church yet? Are they hailing men and women and calling them bound to Jerusalem? No. Probably not. And I don't think Sosthenes was either. So there's nothing in the text here, if you would go back to Acts chapter 18. There's nothing in the text that gives us any reason to think Sosthenes couldn't have gotten saved. Well, people say, and I, and I point to the example of Paul and say, you know, Paul, Paul was far worse from what we know than Sosthenes ever was. And they'll say, yeah, but Paul did it ignorantly. He says he did it ignorantly. You know, what they mean by that is he didn't know he didn't know Jesus. He was unsaved. Yeah, I know he didn't know Jesus in the sense that he was saved, but you can't say he didn't know Jesus. And he knew who Jesus was. And no one gets saved without knowing who Jesus is, right? I mean, Paul clearly had to have known who Jesus Christ was while he was alive on this earth. I mean, he 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 was in Jerusalem. He would have heard and seen things. Like I said earlier, I have no doubt in my mind that he even saw the Lord Jesus Christ probably more than one occasion. Maybe even saw the miracles. Maybe even heard the preaching. <clears throat> I mean, when he got saved, when he was on his way to Damascus, Paul, Jesus Christ said to him, he said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus Christ, whom thou persecutest. You think, you think Paul didn't know he was persecuting? I know he was going after the church, but he understood, why, he understood why he was going after the church. Because they followed Jesus Christ. He knew who Jesus Christ was. The Scripture tells us the nature of Paul's ignorance. Because the Bible does say Paul was ignorant. And I should have had you stay for Timothy. That's alright, just, just stay where you are. But the Bible says in 1 Timothy where we were, it says that Paul was before a blasphemer, that he was before a persecutor, an injurious, and he says, I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. That's the ignorance of Paul. It wasn't just that he was blameless because he didn't know who God was. It's because he was unbelieving. That's the nature of Paul's ignorance. Paul, when he was doing all those things, when he was blaspheming, when he was persecuting, when he was injuring the church, when he was destroying the faith, he was acting as any unsaved or unregenerate sinner might. He was just acting. He was following the course of this world. But one of the main reasons, if you would, turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. One of the main reasons that I believe this guy Sosthenes got saved here is because of what we we're going to read here in 1 Corinthians 1. And there's really no arguing with this. I mean, it's just, this is a case closed, you know, verse here. Look at 1 Corinthians 1, verse 1. Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ, the will of God, and Sosthenes, our brother. 
So it calls Sosthenes his brother right there. Now, where was Paul when Sosthenes got beat? He was in Corinth. Who's Paul writing to in 1 Corinthians? The Corinthians in Corinth. It only stands, and this is the only other mention of Sosthenes in the scripture. This is the same guy. And I, I you'd have a hard time convincing me otherwise. I mean, I'm open to being correction. I've asked around. Nobody, everyone that I've talked to seems to agree with me on that. It makes perfect sense. So here we have Sosthenes, the same guy that was dragging Paul before Gallo, Gal Gallio to be beaten, who himself ended up getting beaten, now being called our brother in 1 Corinthians 1. You know, and the, the, we could further prove that by the fact if you look at verse 14. You say, well, maybe it's a different Sosthenes. Well, would you say that about, about Crispus? It says in verse 14, I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius. So there you have another guy that's in the same... In Acts 18, the same as Sosthenes. You have Sosthenes and you have Crispus. Both mentioned in Acts 18. 1 Corinthians 1.1, 1, 1, you have Sosthenes and you have Crispus. It's the same guy. And he's called a brother. And it's interesting because of the fact of what he had to go through. You see, Sosthenes was a hard case, wasn't he? Especially when you compare him to Crispus. Remember Crispus, the first chief ruler of the synagogue? He didn't get beaten. It just says that he believed. <laughs> Crispus was the predecessor of Sosthenes as the chief ruler. We know that. Go back to our text, to verse 11. It says in, te in our text in verse 11, Acts 18, 11, And he, Paul, continued there in Corinth a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. So he's there a year and six months. You know, sometime after the fact that Crispus had gotten saved. And he, of course, we already know, we're going to look at it here in a minute, that if a Jew were to believe on Jesus Christ, they were put out of the synagogue. And it only makes sense that if, if this guy Crispus got saved, of course he's not going to continue as chief ruler of the synagogue. He's not going to continue leading people after a false religion. He's going to turn from his idol unto the living God. So and he, it goes without saying that he got out of the synagogue. So he gets out of the synagogue. He joins the church there in Corinth that Paul established. Paul continues there a year and six months. And during that time, I believe Sosthenes is just resisting the whole time, he's just resisting. It reminds me of when Paul, uh, when Paul was on the road to Damascus, and he said, "And he said, Who art thou, Lord?" He said, "I am Jesus Christ, whom thou persecutest." He said, "It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks." You ever think about what he means by that saying? He says, "It's hard for thee to kick against the pricks." It's like when you would go to an animal. You know, if you were if you were trying to drive an animal along ahead of you, you'd have a stick and you'd have a prick on it, and you would prick that thing until you poke him right in the back back parts and get him to move. That's what, that's, what, uh, that's what Jesus Christ was saying about Paul. That When he was getting pricked, he said, hey, you need to go in this direction. You need to come to Christ. He didn't move. He kicked like a mule would. He was stubborn. And I believe that's what was probably going on with Sosthenes here. I mean, I, I tend to think there's nothing in Scripture that can't prove this, but let's just use a, a little logic here. You know, I mean, they're both in the same city. They're both probably part of the same synagogue. They had to have known each other, Crispus and Sosthenes. I mean, they might have been friends. And Crispus gets saved and leaves the synagogue. And I wonder if Sosthenes didn't just start to stew. Like, he's just, man, my friend got saved. I can't stand this Paul guy. He probably knew who Paul was. Paul's in town. He's stealing our church members, right? <laughs> he's just getting all kinds of, oh, oh he, he's resisting. You know, he's a hard case. <clears throat> Now who, was, now, who was it that Sosthenes, as Paul, would have been resisting? Well, it was like Stephen said, the Holy Ghost. They're resisting God. And again, I just want to reiterate the fact that all Jews are just not, these people that we read about, the Jews in the Bible, they're not reprobate by default. We have to remember that when we're dealing with people. That just because we knock on someone's door and give them the gospel and they reject it, that doesn't make them a reprobate, folks. That just means it's not their time. They're not going to get saved today. And that's why we should always leave in a, in a, with the right spirit and, and, and say, God bless you, even if they're cantankerous. Try to kill them with kindness, you know? Amen. That way, when the next Christian comes along, we knock that door again, they're, they're going to say, oh, maybe that they'll be a little bit more softened towards the things of God. Maybe then they'll listen. But if we go, oh, you know, I'm from a Faithful Word Baptist Church. I don't want your religion. Get the door slammed. Well, thanks a lot, you big jerk, and you know, start you know getting after him. You know, you reprobate. Just, you know. 
Just start calling them names. You know, you shake your raiment, your blood be on your own head. You know? That's gonna leave quite the impression and not the right one. You know, we should we should walk away and say, well, maybe today just wasn't their day. Maybe they were having a bad day. <clears throat> and we can come back. But Sosthenes, he was one that was resisting the Holy Ghost. And that doesn't make him a reprobate. I think Sosthenes' problem was, and if you would turn over to John 7 again, keep something in Acts. Turn over to John 7. The problem with Sosthenes is probably with the same problem a lot of the Jews had. Is that he feared God more than man. Or excuse me, he feared man more than God. I got that backwards. He was more afraid of what man thought than what God thought. Here in John 7, look, verse, look at verse 11. Then the Jews sought him at the feast. They sought Jesus and said, Where is he? And there was much murmuring among the people concerning him. For some said, He is a good man. And others said, Nay, but he deceiveth the people. How bad, howbeit no man spake openly of him for the fear of the Jews. They were afraid of men. They didn't want to speak openly. If you want to turn to John chapter 12, this is a common theme throughout the book of John and elsewhere in Scripture. That people were afraid of men. They were afraid of what the Jews would say, do, or think. It says in John 19, And after this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, he was a disciple, he was saved, he's following Christ, he believed. He says, but secretly, for fear of the Jews. So he was afraid of men. The Bible says in John 9, These words spake his parents. And this of course, in John 9, you're going to John 12, but in John 9, we recall the story of the one that was born blind, and they... And Jesus heals them. They say, "Why?" And he says, "He was he was born blind to the glory of God." And the blind man shows himself to, to the to the Jews, and they go to the parents and say, "Is this your son?" And the sons don't want to answer because they know it was Jesus that did it that healed him. They said, "He is of age. Ask him." It says that these words spake as parents because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that if any man did confess that he was Christ. He should be put out of the synagogue. People didn't want to lose their favorite spot in the synagogue, their seat. They didn't want to lose their friends. They didn't want to lose the fellowship that they had there. They were afraid of what the Jews would do. They were afraid of being put out. They had a, the fear of man. Here in John 12, we'll see it again. Look at verse 42. Nevertheless, among the chief rulers, many of the chief rulers also many believed on him. So here we see again chief rulers of the synagogue believing on Christ, getting saved. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. And Jesus, it's, it's no wonder that he warned of this very thing. I mean, he told his disciples, he said, These things have I spoken unto you, and those things were that all men would hate you. If they've hated me, they will hate you also. He said, These things have I spoken unto you, that you should not be offended. They shall put you out of the synagogues. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you... Will, uh, will think that he doeth God's service. And the Bible is clear that we should not fear man. And I believe that's what's going on here with Sosthenes. I think he that was why he was resisting. That's why he was such a hard case. And that might be why we have a hard case in our life. If there's somebody we know that's resisting, and that's not, you know, they're, 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 they're resisting the gospel, they're resisting the things of God, it's because they're afraid of what other people might think. What their family might think, what their friends might think, what their co-workers might think. There's a lot of reasons why people resist God. It's not just because they're reprobates. A lot of times it's because of the fear of man. The Bible says in Proverbs 29, I'll read to you, it says this. The Bible says in Proverbs 29 that the fear of man bringeth a snare. It says, whosoever shall fear man, it bringeth a snare. <clears throat> now we see the snare in our text. And it goes on in Proverbs 29 and says, But whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. It says if you fear man, you're going to get in a snare. But if you put your trust in God, you'll be safe. You won't get caught. And I love the fact that we see the snare and we see the safety that's spoken of in Proverbs in our text. You're there in Acts 18, look at verse 6. Paul trusted God and he certainly did not fear any man, did he? Look at Acts 18, verse 6. We'll see that Paul did not fear man. He said, and when, the, and when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, I just love the, 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 the visual you get of Paul doing this. Him shaking his raiment at him. I mean, just getting it at I mean, it wasn't just like, 
You know, like was a brother Hunter in our in our preaching uh, in our in our uh, TD Jakes video, the Fortune Fifty Challenge. We took his coat off, right? I mean, he was furious. He's shaking his raiment at him. You know, like shaking the dust off his feet. And he says, uh, "Your blood be on pawn your own heads." That's not very nice. He says, "I am clean. From henceforth, I will go to the Gentiles." Now you say, well, yeah, that, that's, he's just being showy. Well, let me remind you, that Paul did this in the synagogue to these Jews after he'd been stoned in Acts 14. I mean, he's already, been, he's already had these same Jews come, not these Jews, but Jews come after him and pursue him to another city and stone him and leave him for dead. I mean, Jews suffered at the hands, suffered at the hands of the Jews mightily, multiple times. I mean, he, he, he'd been whipped by him, beaten, stoned. And if that didn't stop him, he wasn't afraid of man. He stood up and said, you know what? Your blood be on your own heads. I go to the Gentiles. He's a bold man. He put his trust in the Lord, right? And therefore he was saved. That's why it says in verse 9, and Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision, Be not afraid, but speak, and hold not thy peace, for I am with thee, and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in this city. You know, it's interesting that he received that vision after he made the statement to the Jews, after he shook his raiment, after he put his trust in God, then God comes and reassures him. It wasn't the other way around. Paul didn't sit back and say, should I say this, Lord? Are you going to be with me? He just went ahead and said, he said, you know what? You blood be on your own heads. And then God comes to him and says, no man's going to hurt you, Paul. I want you to stay here in Corinth and continue. No man will sit on me. And isn't that exactly what we see play out? They try to take Paul and get him in trouble with the, with the authorities, get him cast in prison or beaten or killed or whatever. And before he can even open his mouth to respond and defend himself, Galileo says, you know what? What are you even doing here with this guy? You know, if it's a matter of your law, see, he do it. I will be no judge of such matters. And he dismisses the case. Before Paul doesn't even have to plead his defense. And he gets thrown out of court. God was with him. God came through on his word. He said, I am with thee, and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee. But we also see that snare, don't we? We see it with Sosthenes. Fearing man. And it just might be that, you know, as Sosthenes was a heart case, it may be that you know somebody in your life who's a heart case, and they won't come to Christ because they're snared. Be it the fear of man or some other thing. And I love that that language, snared. You know, it's not something we talk about. We, we use a lot. I mean, if we were if we were around people who did any kind of hunting or trapping, they would know what a snare is. You know, it's a trap, something that you lay. You know, like you know, like a. I don't know any traps. To be honest, <laughs> just because I'm from Michigan doesn't mean I know all the traps, right? But I've known guys who would do it, and uh, you know, they go out and they set traps, and they and they and they catch animals. They set snares. Now, if you've ever seen a snared animal. You know one thing about a snared animal, it cares about nothing else but getting loose. I mean, it doesn't care how wet it is, if it's raining, it doesn't care how cold it is, it doesn't care how hungry it is, it's going, it, it'll try and chew its own foot off to get out of that snare. There's nothing pleasant about being snared. They want to escape. But the thing about a snare is, is that it's impossible to escape. And it's somebody else that has to come along and release that snare. And somebody else has to come along and let that animal go. To, let, to release that trap and let them go. And if you've ever tried to, if you ever see a snared animal, you know, if you try to approach a snared animal, they will fight you tooth and nail. I mean, they will fight you to the death. I know guys that when they would go, they would do trap, they would trap, um, you, you have to club the animal before you take it out. You have to kill it before you can get it out of the snare, obviously. They fight, right? They're snared. They want loose. It always reminds me of this, uh, when I drove for UPS back in Michigan, I had this Saturday route where I go out and deliver all the next day air packages. And the route I had was really rural. I had to go out, out in these just long distances, you know, way out in the woods. And the guy who ran that route during the week, the full-time driver, I was out on a Saturday delivering. I saw the full-time driver at a gas station um, just out in the middle of nowhere, out in the boonies of Michigan. And he's, on the, he's over by a payphone. This is before cell phones were really popular, I guess, or he didn't have one, I'm not sure. He couldn't get reception or something, but he's at a payphone, and I, so I, I pulled over, I recognized him, because I was on his route. It was just, you know, I was living the next day air on that Saturday, just to kind of talk to him for a minute, and uh, I said, well, what's going on? What are you doing? And he was a trapper. 
And he said, well, I'm trying to get a hold of the DNR. And what had happened was he had set a snare, he set a trap for, I don't know what it was he was trying to catch. But a bald eagle came down to take the bait. And he, he came up on his trap, he was checking his traps, and there was a bald eagle in it. Now, we, you know, we always see bald eagles on you know, currency and things like that. But if you ever see one in person, one that's not in captivity, one that's grown up in the wild, you know, if it's healthy, I mean, those birds stand, they're tall, they're big animals, and they're intimidating. And uh, he, he came up on that thing and he had to, he said he tried to let it loose, but man, it, it would have probably just sunk its talons in him and you know, who knows what. So he's getting the DNR. I talked to him about it later, I had to go, but he said that they came and they had to like get it with some kind of a thing around the neck, you know, like a pole and, and blindfold it before they could let it go. So the point I'm trying to make here is that when somebody's snared, you know, they, they'll, they're, they don't like it. They, they'll fight, they'll resist. And you're not going to be able to just come up on your hard case who's afraid of man, who has that snare in them, and just expect to just let him go in a moment. You're going to have, it's going to take some work. And that's what the Lord had to do here with Sosthenes. He had that snare. He was caught in the snare of the fear of man. And God had to kind of work on Sosthenes. He had to loosen up that snare and let him go, didn't it? And that's exactly what we see here in verse 17. God uses man to loosen up the snare in Sosthenes' heart. He says, Then all the Greeks took Sosthenes, the chief ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat. You know, that was the trapper coming along and clubbing the animal, right? Before, and taking him out of the trap, setting him free, putting him on the dinner plate. And Galileo cared for none of those things, the Bible says there. You know, and it's interesting, you have to think about what Sosthenes went through, because that's it. That's all you read about Sosthenes until you get to 1 Corinthians 1. I wonder what went through Sosthenes' mind when he was at home nursing those wounds. You know, a lot of times God will use things like that. I've known people who testify to that. God will put you on your back, literally. Put you in a hospital bed to get you to start thinking about some spiritual things. Sometimes that's what it takes to get a person who's hard-hearted. Somebody who's being a hard case, somebody who's being stiff-necked, somebody who's resisting God. God doesn't just give up on them and say, oh, have it your way. God will start working on them. And it just might be that he'll beat them. I mean, I'm sure Sosthenes went home with a little bit more than a limp. This wasn't a slap on the wrist, I don't think. I think this was a beating. It says that he drove them from the judgment seat. I mean, Sosthenes probably had to lay on his back for a while and nurse those wounds and let the swelling go down and let the, let the, let the, the wounds heal. And all that time he's thinking about, maybe Crispus was right. Maybe Paul's right. He started to think about the things he'd heard. I mean, I believe he was in that synagogue when Paul first showed up in court. When he preached to them Christ and then said, you know what? He, and when they had blasphemed, might have been that it was Sosthenes that was one of the ones that was blaspheming. He started to think about the things that Paul had preached to them. The Bible says in Proverbs 20 that the blueness of a wound cleanseth away evil. It says the blueness of a wound. That's talking about a bruise. You ever get hit hard enough? You have one of those bruises that's just bright blue? or a deep, deep, dark purple. That bruise doesn't just go away overnight. It says the blueness of a wound cleanseth away evil. So do stripes. It's talking about getting stripes on your back, getting beaten with the rod. Stripes, the inward parts of the belly. Sometimes people have to go through some physical suffering even to start to get right with God, to start thinking about spiritual things. And it just might be that that hard case you know needs life to beat on them a little bit more. We should never give up on people that we consider a hard case. And, and, and just trust that God knows that what, what it is that they need. And just let life work on them. Life has a way of working on people. The Bible says the way of the transgressor is hard. The person who's going to resist God, the person who's going to mock the things of God and scoff at the things of God, they're going to, it's going to catch up to them. Sure, everything seems fine today. Life's a party. But eventually, it catches up to them. And the Bible says that the way of the transgressor is hard. When they start to have to go through trouble with the law, trouble, money problems, family problems, all these things that start to work on their heart and loosen up the snare. Then maybe, maybe years, maybe a decade will go by. And they'll start to say, okay, tell me again about Jesus. Tell me what John 3.16 said again. Remind me one more time. Our job for the hard case is to be there when they finally come around. When that person finally starts to come around, <clears throat> it's up to us to be there. 
The Bible says, if you're still there in Acts 18, look at verse 18. After Sosthenes had gotten beaten, after Sosthenes had been driven, after Sosthenes was at home, licking his wounds, thinking about the things that God, or that Paul had preached to him, it says in 18, and Paul, after this, tarried there yet a good while. He was still around when Sosthenes was, was, was coming around. And that's what we need to do. You know, and I've thought about this, you know, because it's easy, you know, I, to say these things and talk about it, sometimes it's hard to understand exactly what I mean by all this, and I, but I, I think we're getting to this morning. And I've, I've gone back and forth since I wrote this about whether or not I shared this bit about myself because it's uh, it's a it's not easy, <laughs> you know. And there's nothing more pathetic than seeing a grown man cry. So <laughs> try to keep it together here. But my mom was a hard case. My mom, when I first got saved, I. Uh, her first thing that she said to me when I got saved and, and started living, I remember I called her the day I got saved. I said, Mom, I got saved. She said, well, I'm proud of you. You know, and I didn't grow up in a Christian home. I mean, I was running around being wild, doing all that stupid stuff, and I was making a mess out of my life, and everybody knew it. So I called her and said, hey, Mom, I got saved. They said, well, that's great, honey. Good for you. You know, she was being nice about it. Then I started getting a little bit more serious about the things of God, trying to start cleaning up my life and things like that. And then it was like, maybe you need to see a psychiatrist. <laughs> So she told me, you know, because the, the, the change was so dramatic. And, you know, when we first get saved, we were really zealous, maybe too much. You know, we're trying to get everybody else saved and we're, you know, trying to, uh, you know, push our, our own beliefs maybe a little too much while we believe. And I think that's kind of what I did where she says, look, you know, I think you had some issues here. But after time, you know, I stayed faithful and it took years. And over that time, my mom, I mean, I can remember conversations where she, she, she mocked God. You know, she mocked him. And I, I feared for her. You know, and I tried, uh, you know, at that time I really didn't know how to give the gospel. I wasn't, you know, unfortunately. <laughs> but it wasn't long after that my mom was diagnosed with, uh, with cancer, breast cancer. And she went through uh, years of fighting that. She went through, uh, had a double mastectomy, uh, radiation, chemotherapy, you know, you name it. She went through a lot of that stuff. And uh, she developed fibromyalgia, I believe, at the end, where even just the shirt touching her arm was causing her pain. She still hadn't gotten saved. But around this time, what had started to happen was my, my mom would come to church with me every so often to the Baptist church I was going to. You know, I, I would ask her to come to church with me and she would go. You know, she'd appease me. She was glad. At this time, I'd kind of, you know, I'd kind of my, even my keel a little bit with spiritual things. I was just trying to be a light to them, be a testimony, let them see my good works before, God, before men, that they would glorify my father, that kind of thing. And it started to work, you know, they were glad that, you know, I was saved and had gotten out of the, you know, the, the lifestyle I was living, you know, partying and all that. So they were glad for that. So she'd come along and she'd go to church and she'd listen to the preaching and other ladies in the church would come and try to preach her the gospel and, and talk to her about Christ and things like that. And she'd listen to them. You know, but she started doing that when she'd gotten sick. And, uh, you know, it got to the point with her arm that she was actually considering having it removed that they were actually going to take her arm off. They were going to remove it. And it gotten that bad. So I just kind of watched my mom for, you know, literally years, just this disease just taking her piece at a time, piece at a time, piece at a time. It was really hard to watch. But, uh, you know, eventually got to the point where she just couldn't fight anymore. You know, I mean, it's a hard thing to fight and uh, decided she was just going to let it take over. And it went to her brain. She got, uh, she got brain cancer. And I'll never forget... She was a hard case, and I, I'm sharing this because I don't want anybody else to think you can give up on a hard case or that you should. She was in her she was in her bed on her on her uh, her dying bed. We put her in that bed that and she was going through hospice at home. And uh, I remember the first night she was in, it was such a strange thing to put somebody in a bed that you know they're never gonna get out of, but she was in that bed. And the first night she was just restless. I mean, she's just kept trying to get up, me and my uh, uh, my stepdad was there and we were trying to, you know, mom, you got to stay in the bed, you know, don't, you're, you're going to hurt yourself. And then she said, I got to go, I got to go. I said, mom, where are you going to go? And she reached out and she grabbed me by the shirt and she looked me down. She said, I'm going to go to hell. Like that. I mean, that intense. Grabbing me. I'm going to go to hell. You know, and, uh, and that's when I knew that that snare was finally getting loose. That that disease had run its course, and now she's ready to receive. She's ready to be set free. 
So I, you know, I had the pastor, because of course at that time I didn't know anything about soul winning, so I had my pastor come over and he, he prayed with her, and I believe she got saved, you know, as far as I know, she got saved the next day, and she's in heaven. But my mom was a hard case, you know, and I don't want anyone in this room to ever think that there's somebody in your life that's beyond salvation just because they've rejected you. Just because they've said, you know what, I, I don't need your religion, don't put your religion on me. You know, I don't care about what your church is saying. You know, they, they reject you. They reject the Bible. You just let life work on that person. You just look at them like a Sosthenes. You know, maybe you have to shake your raiment a little bit. And you let God work. And you let man work. And you let life work them and, and beat them down a little bit. And there'll come a day when that hard case, they'll reach out and grab you. Then they'll say, you tell me what it is I need to know. Don't give up on your hard case. Amen. Pray that they wear out in that snare. Your job is just to be there for a good long while and be ready to let them loose when they finally do. Let's pray.